Do you consider yourself an immigrant? Take a moment, think about that. What does it mean to be an immigrant? When does one cease being an immigrant? We accept that people can have multiple identities. One can be tied to the state they inhabit, and we accept that one can be tied to birthplace, parental lineage. Immigration law determines which people are permitted to enter a country, which people are not, and the conditions in which that entry can take place. Britain has been New Zealand's number one source of migrants since 1987. Now, how often do you hear of complaints about a British invasion? Or recently, a South African invasion? So we have to understand that immigration is tied to ideas about race and ethnicity, but it's also tied to ideas about racism and ethnic superiority. What a state does is a state crafts an identity for itself, a collective identity. And then that collective identity is used as a means of determining who is welcome and who is not. Post-treaty, we had a number of industries that began to develop. And what do we need for industry to flourish? We need labor. Chinese workers began arriving in the 1850s. Anti-Chinese sentiments began to blossom. So there were a number of organizations established. We had one group that was known as the Anti-Chinese League. And their motto was a battle against the infiltration of Mongolian filth. Now keep in mind, this statement came out in 1857, the members of this league had been in the country for less than 17 years. This was an ad. Will it come to this? And there are suggestions that British descendants, that white people, should be the ones who enjoy the privilege of the seat, and the Chinese should be the ones standing. Now we're not quite there yet, but the question that is posed to us Will it come to this? One step that was implemented to reduce the number of Chinese who were arriving was a poll tax. The number of Chinese migrants permitted to enter the country depended on how much cargo was coming from China at the time. So at first we set it up that we said for every 10 tons of cargo, one Chinese migrant was permitted. It was increased at a later stage to 100 tons, and then it increased again to 200 tons. We had a poll tax, as I said. The poll tax began at first was 10 pounds and was increased shortly thereafter to 100 pounds was imposed. So they required, a Chinese migrant was required to pay what would be the equivalent of 5,000 British pounds today. And this was not abolished until 1944. Another step was a permit system. So people who were not of British or Irish birth and parentage had to obtain a permit to come to New Zealand. So this is what Prime Minister William Massey said was necessary to maintain a white New Zealand. Was New Zealand white at the time? Not exactly. What were some of the fears that fueled this anti-Chinese bigotry? Economic equivalency. A fear that they can do something as well, if not better, than we can. Mm. So the fear was that somehow, right, it wasn't just an equivalency, somehow we were going to move to a situation where there was an Asian ascendancy, Asian supremacy. Interracial marriages, precisely. This was a dominant fear, <laughs> not just from colonizers who came to New Zealand, but colonizers who went to other parts of the world. And so there's a fear that somehow there would be this racial interbreeding. Um, because the Chinese used to work long hours, um, there was sort of a fear that they would sabotage jobs for um, the European. Mm -hmm. Bingo. 
Well, one thing that can be said about Chinese culture is that they're very hard workers. And being hard workers, there's a possibility they're in fact harder workers than the people who are here, which would result in them getting the jobs rather than those who help them. Demographics began to shift. And so we had a large, an increase of migrants who were coming from the Pacific Islands. Now, ease of entry of islanders has very much depended on New Zealand's labor market. Look in the 50s and the 60s, there were a large number of Tongans and Samoans who came to New Zealand to help primarily in the manufacturing sectors and the agricultural sector, which were doing quite well at the time. These islanders arrived on temporary permits, temporary work permits, work visas. And once the permits expired, many decided to stay and didn't go back. Now because the need for labor was strong, Nothing was done about this. There was an economic downturn in the 70s, and islanders were now seen as taking jobs from real New Zealanders. Then one day, there weren't enough jobs either. The people became angry, and violence broke out, especially among those who had come from other places expecting great things. Especially those who had come from other places expecting great things. The presumption is that which character has come from somewhere else? The, obvious, the answer is obvious. The National Party ran on an anti-immigration platform in the 70s and were successful. They began a series of random checks of suspected Pacific Island overstayers, known as the, the Dawn Raids. Precisely, the Dawn Raids. Early in the morning, the police would go into a particular neighborhood and verify people's status. And if they were overstayers, then they would be deported. Now, what's most interesting about the Dawn Raids is not the behavior, because the behavior is perfectly legitimate. What's most interesting about the Dawn Raids is who was being targeted. So we are targeting specifically Pacific overstayers. Now, in fact, if you looked at the numbers, you had a far greater number of British overstayers. So there are far more British overstayers, but no raids were carried out against them. The government's policies did not go completely unopposed. This was in 1979. You had one individual, a woman by the name of Lessa, Lessa, and she was a convicted overstayer from Samoa. She challenged the government in their attempt to deport her to Samoa. So her claim was based on the 1949 New Zealand Citizenship Act. And what that act had done was to grant Western Samoans New Zealand citizenship, or at least Western Samoans who were born before 1949. Her case went all the way to the Privy Council. Lesson one, the response from the Muldoon government was to pass a new Citizenship Act, 1982, overturning the decision. Specifically overturning the decision. And the Citizenship Act remains in place today. In the late 20th century, the fear became, once again, Asian migrants. Now, in the 1980s, New Zealand was in need of skilled migrants. So we had a concern about a brain drain in New Zealand. People who would get their education here in New Zealand would go to other places. They would either leave for Europe, for North America, or Australia. And that was resulting in a shortage of skilled workers. What we decided was to shift the immigration policy that was in place. So in 1987, a new law was enacted that established a kind of points system. So you would get points depending on your level of education, how much money you had, how much experience. So the idea was to create a color neutral system of assessment whereby people would be ranked according to merit. There are many states where this is still in place. It still is in place in New Zealand. It's in place now in Canada as well. 
Everyone in New Zealand, everyone here has come from somewhere else. We can see that Māori began arriving a thousand years ago. We know that Europeans began arriving in the late 1700s, early 1800s. We know that the Chinese began arriving in the mid-1850s. So everyone comes from somewhere else. So how does a government go about determining who has a right to be in a particular state and who does not? Should it be based on where they've come from? Should it be based on how much money they're bringing? Should it be based on their level of education? Should it be based on skin color? Religion? Values? Norms? Morals? I'm posing these questions just to show you how difficult it is to craft an immigration policy. Often, what is underpinning the discussion is what is in national interest. So we're looking at what our goals are, our objectives, our aims, what it is that we need, what is good for us. Canada has a live-in caregiver program. You have to live in the home of your employer, and you are paid $800 a month, 500 of which goes to room and board. If you last 24 months, then you're granted residency. If one was terminated from their position, they had to locate another family within 10 days. And if they didn't do so, then they would be subject to deportation. What's the response? There are a thousand people leaving the Philippines a day. They want to get out. And here, you're providing them with opportunity. So the question that we're asking ourselves is, what, is the, what are the morals that are driving immigration policy? The focus has very much been on what is economically favorable, advantageous for the host country. 